This is Alan Karpik with Tom Deanhart. My favorite hour on Tuesdays. We just, Tom and I do this off the record more than anything else. We talk chew the chew the fat about, we use another word than fat, but chew the fat for pretty talking football. But today is part of our Acre Pro buy sell feature. We'll talk, uh, kind of get us up to date on who's hot, who's not with Purdue football and beyond. And when it comes to land sales, it pays. Tom Deanhart knows this better than oh, yeah. anybody else. It pays to have experts in your corner. Acre Pro Midwest Farm Group are your local farmland specialist with decades of experience in Indiana agriculture. No one knows the market better when you're doing a 1031 exchange or simply buying and selling farmland. Your local Acre, Acre Pro agent and will talk. Will walk the land. Will talk the talk, and will with you and ensure the deal is done right. Visit acrepro.com or, or call 765-587-3185 and talk to your local land expert today. All right, the good folks at Acrepro Pro give us a little bit of avenue to have this Tuesday conversation. We just talked offline, Tom, about how you, you know, hard to take a lot from a 56 to nothing uh, drubbing, and yet you look ahead to really, it's really gonna, I, I, I I think you would agree it's a pivotal game for Purdue. Yeah. Mm. Uh, without question, the direction of the season is going to rest on what we what we know at about three thirty Eastern time on Saturday. But let's go back to to Indiana State. Uh, you know, again, Aiden O'Connell completes seven of nineteen passes, uh, plays a half. I thought that was a good thing. Um, you're still buying that Aiden O'Connell is going to have a great year. Or how do you how do you view that after two games? Well, I think you got to, given his track record, <clears throat> Alan, um, just a very accurate quarterback, and he's proven that time and again. I think the body works deep enough and wide enough and long enough for us to, to I think, at least for me to comfortably make that assumption that I think he's going to have a nice year. As long as they keep protecting him, Alan, they've done a yeah. good job protecting him. He does a good job getting rid of the ball quickly, too. Remember that. That's such a big component. I think Purdue runs a lot of routes that are quick opening routes as well. So um, they all know how to work in synchronicity. Uh, you know, Jeff Brom tries to make it all work out. But yeah, my gosh, um, 17 and 19 after that somewhat, I guess, okay debut. And we all know, well, he's gonna have to be on the money up in the uh, JMA wireless. <laughs> I know, I'm having a hard time with that. Wireless Dome Center. For old people like you and I, it's always going to be the Carrier Dome, right? But anyway, yeah, he's going to have to have a big game up there at noon or Eastern time when it kicks off. And uh, like you said, my friend, I think about a lot of strange things when I go on walks. And I'm thinking, I mean, Alan, if they lose this game, they could be two and two coming into October. And October is the month I always thought was going to be the key month. And look at that October schedule, Alan. I mean, could pretty go two and two. I mean, I'm, I guess I was on my priest's gonna be four and four going in November, so I'm working way ahead now. They're four and four. Are they gonna get bowl eligible? So I let my brain roll too fast downhill sometimes. But like you said at the top of the segment, this is a big game. I know it's only mid September, but Syracuse is playing well. It's gonna be a, a hostile environment. They're excited up there in upstate New York. Syracuse is playing well. And uh, again, Purdue's going to get their best shot. I know they're about a one-point favorite right now, Purdue is, but like you said, this game could really set a, a positive or a negative tone moving forward, I think. You know, you, do you and that's a good buy-sell question. Do you buy, though? Because remember we talked last year, I think on Sunday, thought it might be Purdue might be a two- or three-point underdog. The fact that they started as a three-point favorite have dropped maybe to one or whatever it is as of Tuesday. You mm -hmm. buying or selling that? What do you what, what do you what do you buy that? I, I know you're not a gambler, and you're not a guy that uh, is uh, talking to, talking to Vegas. But how do you look at that? I got enough vices, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Business gambling isn't one of them. No, um, I'm, I'm selling it. I mean, I, I guess when I first saw Purdue minus one, I was like, wow, really. Yeah, I assumed Syracuse is going to be the favorite right out of the gate when these lines opened up. So uh, if I was a betting man, I would, uh, and Purdue was getting points, I guess I would take the points in Syracuse. Um, yeah, again, I, I think they're playing real well, Alan. We, we can talk about, I don't know how deep you want to get into the weeds with Syracuse and what they, they have personnel-wise and what they like to do, but they're going to be a tough out, my friend. A veteran coach and Dino Babers, who you know well, used to play basketball yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. I talked to Dino this summer for a story I have on the site now. And 
just a great personality with a lot of appreciation for his time at Purdue with Jim Coletto from 91 to 93. And of course, Alan, as you know, he also followed Bob Spoo as the head coach at Eastern Illinois. Of course, Bob Spoo, a legendary figure at Purdue as a player and an assistant coach. So it's going to be a fun game, but yeah, I think it's going to be packed and crazy up there. Well, let me ask you about Syracuse. The two names, the household names, we always, always, we talk about Garrett Schrader, the quarterback, yeah, uh, and Sean Tucker, the running back. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit in depth about what you see about them and what makes them. I mean, Schrader on film looks or on, looks the part physical, can run the football. Tucker's a guy that's a guy that's can uh, has proven that he can pick up a hundred yards uh, on a regular basis. Uh, what makes them tough? What will make, what as a Tuesday focus at looking ahead to this game, what does Purdue have to do well to stay in this football game? They've really sort of reinvented themselves offensively, Alan. They have a new offensive coordinator and a new quarterback coach. They both came from Virginia. Robert Anai is the uh, yeah. OC, a long time OC for BYU with Lavelle Edwards. Yeah. And, um, you know, they uh, talked about Garrett Schrader, the quarterback. He's a transfer from Mississippi State, got there last year, Al. He's a run-pass guy, yep. a big guy, about 6'4", well over 200 pounds. A lot of read option, Alan. And again, uh, you got to be on your toes. Is he going to keep it or he's going to stick the ball in Sean Tucker's belly? And Sean Tucker's already got over 200 yards rushing this year, Alan. And uh, listening to Dino Baber's press conference yesterday, uh, he had uh, obviously a lot of great things to say about his running back. Uh, he says he's probably the best running back he's ever coached, Baberson. He coached a first-round draft choice named Trung Candidate from Arizona. And he says he's Trung may be a little faster, but this Sean Tucker, he's big and he's fast. And if you don't wrap him up, Alan, he's going to go the distance on you. So he's going to be a big worry and a big concern. That's where the absence of Jalen Graham, I think, hurts Purdue. You don't have your best defensive player on the field against a, a top flight running back and against a quarterback who's playing very well, not just running it, like I said, Alan, but he's completing almost 80% of his passes, I think. They don't have a dominant number one receiver. They have a collection of guys, but again, Schrader's the trigger man doing a good job. And again, they have that elite running back in Tucker. You've watched a lot of football in your young life. Three three five defense. You yeah. buying buying or selling that in terms of what Syracuse will bring and what problems that may pose for yeah. Purdue. You know, Jeff Brown talked about Rocky Long, and Rocky Long was the longtime head coach in New Mexico, and he had a lot of success in Albuquerque running that defense. A very unconventional look. It's a look offenses don't see very often, Alan. And there's different. They're just only typically the three linemen, of course. And then you got a lot of guys creating traffic in the back seven, right? And I think it's going to be hard to get big plays. They don't want to give you big plays. Can Aiden O'Connell pick his spots, get passes in between defenders uh, to keep the ball moving? I think uh, we're all, you're also going to see a lot of different pressures, too, from that, from that look. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's again, Jeff talked about that a little bit yesterday, too, the fact you don't see that look very often. I guess the one benefit if you're Purdue Island is you do have a veteran quarterback who, uh, who's very good at reading defenses post snap. That's when you really got to make your decision. You got a couple seconds, Alan, to decipher what's going on back there and to make your read and decide who to go to with the ball. And again, having Aiden O'Connell, a six year player, helps. So again, there's still going to be, I think, uh, maybe some rough spots in the first half, you'd think, as you adapt as an offense and a quarterback to actually seeing it play yeah. live. Yeah, um, but you'd have to think Purdue's going to probably figure something out here and be able to move the ball a little bit, and they're going to have to. And I think every, every, I think you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that Purdue's probably going to have to score at least thirty points every week to win. Yeah, I, I, I would think so this week, especially that uh, I know that uh, that the Orange have not given up much yet, but they haven't. Well, uh, certainly didn't play much last week in in in, in UConn. All right. Run game is interesting. Uh, we are, again, going back to that premise that we can't read too much into a game against Indiana State. But, mm -hmm. and I don't want to sound like, you know, it's always the backup quarterback or the third string running back that comes in and runs hard and you all love him and you want him to play. And Devin Mockaby is the guy that we're talking about. Yet, you know, Dylan Downing's shown some good signs. Uh, King DeRue in game one, though he was a little bit, I guess, banged up with a calf, did not do a lot against Indiana State. 
does it could does that three three five maybe make a premium on some seams that uh, might be available for a north south runner like Maccabee or or actually all three of those guys are guys that like to go forward so how do you see that yeah you know every defense every offense you have to pick your poison right and you can't do everything well and that three three five does have its vulnerabilities Alan and the defensive line um typically again just having the three guys uh, in, in their stance is, is, a, is, is a bit of a compromise to that defense. And also, Alan, that's a young defensive line, I'm told. Pretty yeah. much all new personnel along their front. They got some good cornerbacks, though, some, a couple NFL cornerbacks, they think. But again, that line, the D line for Syracuse is, is young. It's new. It's still getting worked in. Uh, and again, there could be some vulnerabilities there. And like you said, Alan, I mean, Purdue's going to do what Purdue does. I think they still want to throw the ball at least 40 times, right? But maybe there are some more opportunities Saturday to maybe take advantage of some of those scenes you talked about in the 3-3-5 defense, where, 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 again, maybe a guy like King Daru or Dylan Downing, you referenced, Alan. My gosh, he's really a guy, you know, remade his body in the offseason. He's thinner, he's faster, and we've seen more production from him. So, yeah, again, uh, Tyrone Tracy, too, Alan. We got to see him more involved last week. Yeah, pitching and running the ball. Maybe he's a guy that can strike for some big plays. So yeah, again, I still think Purdue is always going to pass first, but maybe this is a game where we where maybe we do see a little bit more in the run game because of the defense they're facing. No, it's interesting. And Dino is uh, uh, Babers is also going to try to try to you know mix some things up. Interesting situation too. Um, you know, here's a guy that's now been a head coach. This is his 11th season, I believe, as a head coach, uh, starting as such. East Illinois for a couple of years, Bowling Green for two years, gets the job at Syracuse. Has had, you know, has had some ups and downs at Syracuse. He certainly had that 10 and three season and had a had a, uh, uh, but he's also had a one and 10 season uh, <laughs> at the, with the Orange. Are you buying and selling long-term Dino Babers? Because uh, he's a guy that uh, – great guy, and I do remember him well from his days at Jim Clett, a really easy guy to get to get along with and uh, good personality. But uh, how do you view his long-term tenure? This is a big season, one would think, in today's world of firing coaches in the second week of the season. This is a big game for him. It's a really big game, Alan. That, that 10-win season you referenced was way back in 2018. So since then, they got five and seven, one and 10, five and seven. Now they're two and oh this year. So I'm not sure what his contract situation is, how flush they are with cash up there at Syracuse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, and there's no doubt about it. You can't slice it any other way. I think there's a, well, we'll just call it a sense of urgency for Dino yeah. Babers, okay, Alan? I think there's a sense of urgency up there to, to at least get this team back into the postseason. Uh, he obviously, like I said, was proactive this in the offseason, redoing his staff, wasn't standing still. So, yeah, there's uh, – again, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, uh, that they, they know what's at stake here as well. So they want to get back to the postseason. And, uh, you know, he does have a little bit of history with Jeff Brom too, Alan. Yeah. Um, I thought I was doing some research this summer. They each faced off in their very first game – as uh, at head coach at their at, at, at their new jobs when when Dino went to Bowling Green and Jeff Brom got his first job at Western Kentucky so and Jeff Brom won that game like 59 to 31 yeah uh kind of interesting I thought so uh yeah so there's they have squared off before and Dino Babers Allen like Jeff Brom his history has always been about being an offensive guy who's put up some terrific numbers you know Purdue fans saw Dino Babers at Bowling Green yep to bring up a bad memory but 2003 right uh, they, they beat the Boilermakers in Ross in the season opener. So it could be a fun game uh, that really features some some dynamic offenses. Yeah, no question on that front. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to sneeze here. But all right, let's look at now the last thing, buying or selling the environment. Uh, you have that Purdue will be playing in the in the Empire State. I guess that's what they call New York for the first time since 1941. No, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> I, I believe if my research is right. Every time they played, they're three, four, and one all time. They all every other time they played in the most of the times in the venerable old Polo Grounds Yankee Stadium uh, at Fordham back in the 30s and early 40s. So this is their first appearance back. But that environment in Syracuse is unique. Um, the fact that you're going to have a dome stadium with 50,000, it's known for noise, especially in basketball. But yeah. 
you know, Aiden O'Connell, are you buying or selling Purdue's? And you talk, you even mentioned it in Monday's press conference. You've got a veteran team in a lot of ways, or at least an experienced team. Uh, how do you think Purdue responds to this environment? I think they do well, Alan. I mean, <clears throat> on the surface, Purdue seemingly is coming to New York, going to Syracuse, set up pretty well, right? I mean, we couldn't have scripted a, a better Saturday last week, right? Yeah. Yes, I know it was Indiana State, but Alan, they did what they needed to do in emphatic fashion. Right. That that was a great box, great box to check. And um, I tell you what, uh, uh, they're going up there too, like I said in the press conference, with what I think is a veteran team. And yeah. anytime you got veterans who've been through a lot of these battles, you'd think, Alan, they're not going to get rattled maybe when they go into these hostile environments. So I think that checks another good box for Purdue. Yeah. And again, the quarterback leads the way when it comes to experience. So, yeah, I think uh, it, it sets up pretty well for Purdue to handle what I, again, think is going to be a pretty crazy environment up there. Just reading some of their media, listening to Dino Baber's press conference, uh, talking to a member of their media this week. There, there's a lot of buzz and excitement up there for a program, Alan, that's been sleepwalking for a long time. You and I got a lot of good memories of SU football and what it was all about, the history of running backs, the history of number 44 up there. Uh, but again, it's always been a basketball school, but there's a lot of lush football history up there too. And they, they look like they could have a team that could, that could rise up this year. And Alan, I was thinking, you know, this week too, as you said, this is a game in a dome, right? And uh, the last time Purdue was in a dome was Jeff Brom's first game, wasn't it? At, at, down in Indianapolis, correct? Correct. Yes. I was, I was trying to think of other games for Purdue and domes that weren't the metric. I think the ceiling was closed. Now I'm trying to think of that game in 17 against Louisville. I think that they, they that they had the roof closed, the ceiling, the roof was closed because even though it was a nice day, I never understand how that works. Yeah. Anymore. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. And Purdue's obviously played in the, uh, I think that's the last time that Purdue has played in an enclosed stadium. So that's correct. You know, they played in the Metrodome for years and years, but I yep. mean, other than the Metrodome in Indianapolis, I mean, did you have to go back to the Blue Bonnet Bowl? Right. I, I did some. We're going to do that number yeah. crunching this week. Yeah, it's the Blue Bonnet Bowl, the Metrodome. The Blue Bonnet Bowl, of course, the last day of, of 1979, December 31st, uh, and a 27-22 Purdue win. But, yeah, Metrodome, they played from 82 to 2007 there. Did not have – they had some crazy games up there. Yeah. Crazy did. games. Did. Didn't have a lot of success. So they ended it on a strong note in the Tiller era. Well, I guess, Alan, didn't they play? They played uh, in the Motor City Bowl with. Right. Twice. At Ford Field. Up there. So, yeah, Ford Field, too. So it's always kind of fun. Jeff Brom has been to the old Carrier Dome, Allen as a player and a coach. So he's experienced it. Um, but again, this is only seats about 50,000. Yeah. It's not a cavernous dome like the Superdome or the Astrodome, the old Astrodome. A lot more intimate. So you'd think, Alan, you could, could get a lot louder in there too, wouldn't you? Yep. Going to be an interesting storyline, and you've uh, set it up very well for what uh, is game week follows. And as we get closer to Saturday's game, we only hope that your flights make it. Yeah. Uh, and you have no travel issues <laughs> and that you're home sometime before Wednesday of next week. Uh, you're going flying through. I'm going, through Phil I'm going through Philadelphia. And All right. Well, you can you can visit my daughter if you need to have a place to stay. She'll she'll uh, she'll she'll put you up. But yeah, let's hope for good, that. And, and and I think it will be a fascinating game Saturday at noon yeah, yes. when yeah, Purdue yeah. and Syracuse get together. It's one of those games that uh, you know before the year started, I wasn't. I said, ah, you know, Purdue ought to win this one relatively easily, and that changed. And uh, just the way Syracuse uh, whooped two up years, and, and two years in a row going out to the East Coast, right? Of course, UConn last year. Yeah, now they're going back to they're going to Syracuse. Of course, Allen. 2020, they were supposed to go to Boston College. Yeah. Well, this would have been the third of, I guess, of, of a Northeastern junket for, for Purdue. Uh, uh, it's kind of fun. These are the games I always remember the most, Alan, as a kid, when USC came to Purdue and UCLA yeah. and Wake Forest. I mean, Oregon, Arizona, Stanford, those, these non-conference games, NC State, West Virginia, those are the ones I always tend to remember because they're yeah. so unique. And it's just fun to have somebody that still have a pretty big-time elk come to your place or for you to go to their place. Yeah, it's going to be a fun thing to watch and uh, we'll look forward to your coverage the rest of the week. All right, we want to thank our good friends at Acre Pro Midwest Farm Group, uh, Kyle Spray and company. We appreciate all they do. Visit acrepro.com or call 765-587-3185 and talk to your local land expert. Again, that number 765-587-3185. 
Uh, Tom, have a he said we'll look forward to the rest of your coverage. Safe travels out there. We'll be talking to you again many times before before Saturday, as we seem to. And uh, for all of you, we'll be back next week uh, after Syracuse and looking ahead to Florida Atlantic. The Owls will be coming. Uh, Purdue had the Rice Owls in West Lafayette in what 1998. I don't think they've had it played any Owls since. So that will be another thing, another yeah. obscure fact we'll be talking about next week. All right, have a good one, Tom. Thanks. Thanks so much. Take care, Alan.